All right, very cool. Thank you everyone for coming to this session. And uh, let's get started. My name's Ray, I'm a developer advocate for the Google Cloud Platform. What that means is that I like to bring some of our best technology and open source projects to developers all over the world. But I also like to get a lot of your feedback and understand how you use our technology so that we can make our products better. And um, the best way to contact me is actually on Twitter, at Sandinism. Uh, aside from the, 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 um, the presentations I do, I also work on the Spring Cloud GCP project. This is a new project from Google. And uh, it uses uh, idiomatic Spring and Spring Boot experience with uh, the starters and all that and provide you with some really, really awesome integrations with Google Cloud. So if you're interested, uh, definitely take a look. I usually do this talk with my partner in crime, uh, Baruch. Unfortunately, he's not here today, but I still want to give him a lot of the credit for uh, a lot of the interactions that we had. Now, unfortunately, Baruch uh, usually brings in the comedy and makes this a whole lot more funnier than I could ever do. So I'm... I do apologize uh, that uh, you may not get the most funny presentation today. However, I'll try my best. And today I'm going to talk a little bit about microservices. I'm not going to show you the, the theories. I'm, gonna, I'm not going to say whether you should be doing it or not. All of these decisions you have to make yourself, and you have to do this to solve your problems. So, uh, but if you do decide to go into the whole microservices architecture, then there are a lot more problems you have to solve. And I'm here to show you some of the tools and open source tools and uh, Google Cloud tools that you can be helpful. To demonstrate everything, I have written a very simple microservices application here. Uh, this is probably the best looking application I can ever write. I'm not a, back, I'm not a front end developer, so uh, black and white, jQuery, uh, that's the best I can do, right? <laughs> and so this is a very simple application, but it's got two of the best demo application put together. What I mean by that is it's got the Hello World and also a guestbook. That's probably the two of the most sophisticated application I can ever write as well. Uh, but we put this into a, a small example here that will demonstrate uh, some of the issues you might run into with microservices. And so just to show you the, the architecture behind the scenes, um, we have three different services here. We have the front end and two back ends. And then also we're storing data into MySQL and we're doing some session replications and sharing via Redis. So we have three different microservices here, right? Or three different components. Uh, just to show you a uh, very simple app, right? But you don't necessarily uh, wanna go into microservices just for a simple app like that. Just wanna make sure that's the case, all right? So why don't we just go ahead and see it? The way I have deployed this application is in, uh, I'm using Kubernetes, right? So I'm actually running this in Kubernetes with a cluster of five machines. And it's very, very easy to do this, uh, especially on the cloud in a managed service like Google. You just click a button, you get a, a Kubernetes cluster that you can deploy to. But this example runs you know, just every, about everywhere. How many people here are using Kubernetes today? Just want to see a show of hand. Oh, very cool. Um, OK, so I have this old deploying Kubernetes. And just to have a little refresher for people who may ha not have seen this a lot, right? for all of these deployments, right, I have my Hello World UI. I got my uh, guestbook service behind the scenes. I got two instances of that. And all of them are fronted by an internal load balancer so that you can access these backends uh, directly from a load balancer service. right? Uh, all of these things are written down in uh, YAML files so we can declare the desired state, the desired deployment state that we want to have. And all we need to do was to apply this uh, configuration into my Kubernetes cluster. So if I look up one of these deployment files, if I scroll down, go past the copyrights and know that, if I scroll down, I will see that for the guestbook service, this is the back end, I want to have two instances of that. And I need to run uh, which container image, right? That's the image I need to run. And I can set up all the readiness check and health check uh, against all of the instances I have. If anything goes wrong, these, these things will be automatically restarted. I also have uh, deployed a service here, a load balancer in Kubernetes, and a specific one that's of the type load balancer. What that just means is that this load balancer will actually get a real external IP. And this load balancer will be routing the ports. Uh, the load balancer will be listening on port 80 and routing it to port 80 as well. And doing it by using a selector here, basically saying, 
uh, I need to route traffic to any of the Kubernetes uh, applications running inside of it with a certain labels. Okay, these labels are really, really important. So what this is saying that is that for this load balancer here, uh, the hello or UI, uh, it will actually just route to any of the application that has this label, which is called app is equal to hello world UI. And just to show you what that label is being set, that is also part of the deployment descriptor of the hello world UI. And here's the selector for that, right? So here's the match label, hello world UI. If I scroll down a little bit, that single-handedly determines where the load balancer will be routing the applications to, all right? So why don't we just go ahead and take a look at it? And um, you know, oh, that's that's pretty good. So as you can see, that is a, a spring uh, spring application. You can see the little leaf there. So I think that's definitely working. So let me go take a look. Huh. Hold on a sec. Okay. Well, that didn't work. Um, hmm. That's interesting. Unfortunately, usually people have um, a video. But uh, those who know me, I only do live demos. I never make a video backup. So that's not going to work. So um, hmm. thank you for your time. I guess that's it. <laughs> well, let's, let's take a look at it. Let's, let's take a look at it. I mean, this is not the first time I fail my demos. Uh, if I actually go back to, um, to some of the DevOps Belgium presentations, I think every year, every presentation I ever have done at DevOps Belgium, I fail somewhere. Uh, so there are more failures just last year too. Uh, I won't bore you with this because um, you know I look like right now, which is quite embarrassing to be honest. Um, but let's take a look. Let's take a look at this message. It's got some of the worst error messages you can ever possibly find in an error page. Well, first of all, it's an internal server error with 500, and then it's also got a 404 in the same page. But the thing that solves the whole mystery here is the null pointer that just means we're running a Java application. Like, that's, that's really it. <laughs> so that is the root cause of the problem, Java applications. No, but I, I think we have to do a little bit more to kind of figure this out. Um, what do we usually do in this case? If somebody comes to you and say, hey, we have a production issue, take a look, and you see this error page, what do you do next? What do people do? Well. I've been in a situation like this quite often, not with my code, just to be clear, it's not me. <laughs> it's my friend is asking about this, right? It's not, right. So we, I have been in the industry for 15 years now, and I have been in production situations like this where people do call up and say, hey, we need to solve this right now. The first thing I do is to probably ask, well, is the staging environment working, right? Can we reproduce in staging? Yeah, this was dead on arrival, that should probably never happen. But let's go see if staging is here. So in my Kubernetes cluster, I have a single cluster here with five nodes. But what I have also done is by using the Kubernetes construct called the namespaces. So I can carve out the cluster into different namespaces. And in this particular case, I am running different environments in the different namespace. So I'm running my production environment here in default namespace, but I also have a staging namespace. Now, typically, what you should do is to have a dedicated cluster for production, and then all oh, the numprod can probably live in a separate cluster, right? But in my example here, I have my default, like my, my, I got my staging environment. So. In my production environment, I can see everything is up and running. These are just the application instances that you saw in the visualizer. If I look at the service, SVC, these are just all the load balancers I have up and running. And, um, and there's one for the Hello World UI. And this is the one I, I'm trying to hit, right? And that's the one that's not working. However, I can also get my staging environment here, uh, the namespace staging, right, with the dash N. I can see my namespace uh, staging, my staging environment is also up and running. And I should be able to see my services here, too. So there we go. There's a service for my uh, staging environment. And of course, I'll probably go check staging first. And OK, well, that's not bad. So let me just see if that actually works. And OK, that's good. Now, of course, the staging environment is working. Why would you ever go to production? if the staging environment wasn't working, right? The next question I will probably ask is, are they actually the same code base, right? Are they actually running the same code? Is it actually the same application? I need to be sure of that. Now, unfortunately, 
I made a very bad mistake with a very bad practice in my deployment here. I used, uh, for the image coordinate here, um, I am deploying, uh, so this is the image name, right? And then I have a tag here. Uh, the tag usually should be the version of the application you're trying to deploy. And unfortunately, in my case, I used the tag called latest. And this is in particularly bad. Why is that? Because if you ever use a, a container image that's called latest, when you pull down that image two weeks ago, right? That was your latest two weeks ago. If you, somebody else pulls down the same image, say yesterday, he or she will be pulling down the latest image with the content from yesterday. And your latest and that person's latest will not be the same. So this you should never actually ever do. I'm just doing it. Uh, some people say, well, they want to do this just so they are you know, doing the continuous delivery, right? They're always deploying the latest. Not in this way, right? If you always want to deploy the latest version, you should always increment the version number up and deploy the right, uh, the, the right numbers, right? So in this case, in both my staging and my production are using the latest tag. There is a real problem here because my staging environment's latest could be from two weeks ago and my production's latest could be from yesterday. I don't know what's going on. The only sure way to make sure and understand what version has been deployed is by inspecting the image itself and also by looking at the SHA ID of the image. So every image would have a SHA ID that uniquely identify it most uh, cases. So what I can do is, first of all, I can go into my Kubernetes cluster. I can use a, a little command line called describe. I can describe my application instance here for that particular instance. I got two instances here running. If I describe it, what I should be able to see is all the, the command lines that's associated with this particular application startup, all the environmental variable that's associated with it, which I, I'm pretty sure that's correct. Uh, I can see my health check configuration, right? But most importantly, uh, my image here, even though it's latest, I can actually see the SHA ID, right? So here the SHA is 03478, blah, 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 blah. I need some help here. Somebody might have to help me to memorize the last four. I'll memorize the, last, uh, the, the first four, yeah? Zero, 03, you all got it? So what I can do then, I already forgot the number, sorry. <laughs> what I can do then is to go into my staging environment, Right? And I can also do a describe on the pod for the staging environment. And hopefully, the two will match. So if I do that, and I say, let me go into the staging environment. And if I scroll up a little bit, I should be able to find the SHA. Uh, zero for the first four are the same, right? And I think that the last four are the same too, right? If you, somebody check for me, I'm not lying, right? So we are pretty sure these are the same application. But at this moment, we still don't know uh, what's actually running inside of this app, right? Because if I look at the, 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 um, uh, the actual build of this container image, let me see if I can find it, hello world UI. And if I look at the Docker file, right? This is a Docker file that builds everything. Now, when I built it, I also did something really, really bad. You should never do that in your production environment, which is that I'm using the snapshot, right? Again, it's your snapshot the same as this, you know, somebody else's snapshot. Not going to work. So fortunately, though, um, I, I, I did actually send this through a CICD pipeline, and I do have all the metadata stored. In this particular case, uh, I have it running in um, a stored in Artifactory, right? Just one of the places you can store your artifacts. But what is important here is that you should be able to uh, do a describe, right, and find the SHA ID, OK? And hopefully, oh, I need to log in. This is a user experience error here. Yeah, let me log in. And hopefully, what your system can do is to really be able to search based on the shell or based on the image coordinate to see what all the metadata are associated with this build. So in this case, I can actually very clearly see that the latest version that I deployed is actually version 50, right? And I should be able to go in there and see what actually happened in version 50. Like, for example, uh, who deployed it? Mark. I have no idea who Mark is. Um, <laughs> that's unfortunate, right? But we can, we can do more. Like, we can actually see the build pipeline, for example, to see how this is actually built and what application is actually building it and all that. And of course, Jenkins pipeline is down. That happens quite a lot, I think. How many people here actually care about their Jenkins pipeline staying up all the time? Yeah. <laughs> 
<laughs> of course, GM's, GM's in the back. Of course, he cares. Yeah. But Jenkins pipeline do disappear sometimes. <laughs> Not Jenkins X. It's exactly right. However, uh, what you can do in this case is to actually go back to your build system where the metadata is stored and introspect what's actually being built and all that, right? So you can get a lot more information about what you actually deployed in your application. Now, after you determine that, in fact, it is the same application, it went through the build pipeline, it's in staging, you tested it, this is a new bug that you don't know about, what do you do next, right? Well. In this case, I will probably go to the logs. Now, in my back, in my experiences in the past, uh, in a deployment where we just go into the VMs, right? We have like ten machines, which is raw machines. If I need to look at the log, what I usually need to do is to SSH into the right machine, go find that particular instance, and then go find the log message. And hopefully, the the, the file hasn't been rotated out, right? Because if it's rotated, I have to search all the past logs as well. I need to go find this error message. Now, in Kubernetes, there's a much, much easier way. Uh, if you know which instance might have the issue, uh, what you, you, you need to do is to you know, just go and find the instance name. And you can just do kubectl logs. Now, I have two instances running here. right? The error could be in any one of these instances. What are the odds for me to find the error in this one command line? Anyone? 50-50. Yeah, 50, one in two. right? However, in a microservices deployment, if I actually have like auto um, auto um, scale auto scaling, or if I'm running more than two instances, or in this case maybe I go up to ten instances, right? And then you go back to find the pods. Now you look at ten instances. Now what are the odds of you finding the log in this case? Anyone? It's still 50-50, right? Uh, as my famous co-speaker would say, Baruki would say, it's 50-50 because you either find it or you don't. <laughs> and that's why he's not here today. So anyways, <laughs> but, but right, however, if you do want to try it, I can. So all I need to do is to say kubectl logs dash f, and that will follow the logs, and I can actually just go and see. Now, unfortunately, my log is not so good today. Uh, I don't see it here, right? And then I have to go and find another one. The benefit here, though, is I don't actually have SSH in and find all the log messages. I can actually just do this. However, if you do want to see all the instances and all of their logs in one shot, there are two really good utilities that you can use. One is called kubetail, uh, and the other one is called stern. So with these the utilities, what you can do is you can just give it the name of the application or, or the, the deployment, and it will actually go and find all of the instances associated with that application, and then just stream the logs to you. So you don't have to watch, you know, try your luck against an individual instance, right? So if I do a refresh, I can see that it actually went to this instance. I do another refresh, uh, it will just show up again, right? So this is really, really useful. However, again, if you're in a production environment, it, this may not actually work out too well for you because you might be seeing the log a lot. It could be streaming through your screen like metrics, and you will not be able to see anything at all, right? And you might be actually be able to uh, do a, a grip or do some kind of filtering, but still, that is not good enough. In Kubernetes, what most people do is to install some kind of centralized logging component. And you can do this with Elasticsearch, uh, with the whole uh, Elk stack, right? Elast Elasticsearch, uh, Logstash, and Kibana, and all that. Uh, or you can find other uh, vendors that actually provide such a capability. Uh, for this example, though, right, because I do have this running on Google Cloud, what that means is whenever I need to see the logs, uh, all the logs are automatically aggregated for me, right? So again, it doesn't matter which environment you're in, just make sure you have a centralized logger. And what you should be able to do is to, uh, you know, navigate, in my case, let me see here, uh, ba -ba, uh, there we go, GKE container. Yeah, and I can see the different clusters, and then I can go in and see the logs. Now, I need to be in the right project you know, for this particular one. Yeah, uh, ba -ba -ba -ba. there we go. Right. So here I can see the logs, and I should be able to narrow this down to my application. Okay. And then what I can do is to just search and filter and query the log in a centralized location. 
Again, I remember the days where I have to SSH, I have to SCP, I have to copy all the logs just for that particular instant incident, and then do the grape, uh, you know, just scrape or write pearl code to do the filtering, right? Still do that um, if I'm not in Kubernetes, right? But now we can just go ahead and say, well, find me the exception, right? For my Hello World UI application, and I see the exception, I can click into it, and then I should be able to see the entire uh, stat trace. Now, in this particular case, this stat trace is not so good either, right? <laughs> what we are able to see is that in this UI application, there was a 404 null. Again, there's a little ambiguous here. There's 404 is a null, I don't know. But there are two potential errors here we have to potentially troubleshoot. But at least we're getting somewhere. But the log message is not good enough. If this is 2 a.m. in the morning, and I get called up, and I said, OK, fine, you have, a, you have an outage. Is it just for one instance that's having this issue? Or is it all of the instances that's having this issue? Right? That's one of the questions I would be asking. Why? Because if it's just one instance at 2 a.m. in the morning, what do you do? You just restart it, right? Yeah, yeah but, but maybe that's good, maybe that's not. I'll come back to that later. But we need a way to figure this out. And the way I used to do that is by potentially, hopefully, I had a, a, a Hadoop cluster or something I can write a query with using pig or some other query language to kind of figure this out to see are the arrows uh, distributed across multiple instances or is it concentrating on just a few? And if it's just a few, I would do something about it. Now, what the beauty of the, the, you know, in the Kubernetes system is once you have centralized logging, uh, usually, you should be able to export it into other places for you to do a search. Like if you're in Elastic, you should be able to do that as well. Uh, in our case, we can actually export everything into something called BigQuery. And in case you never heard about this before, uh, this is based on some internal uh, project at Google. It's called Dremel. And it was a system that is designed to query structured data without indices. Now, what I can show you here to show you how, this, how, how ridiculous this is, um, we can actually query in this right now. Uh, I'm querying about two terabytes of data, okay? Two terabytes of data that I can query, and that will be done in about 10 seconds. And this is how we actually can handle and process our logs and get insight into what happened in our issues. So for example, to determine whether uh, I have a production issue here on just one instance or multiple instances. Uh, I will probably go to my, um, bu -bu -bu, where did it go? Hide my options. Go into my query history, right? I can actually write a query here to uh, ask some questions. The question here I can ask is, well, let me do a count, so aggregation, uh, with the number of, with the, the instance ID, so that's the application ID, that or the pod ID. Uh, I'm going to filter it based on the resource type, it's a container that is of the application Hello World UI. I'm looking for a wildcard here for exceptions. I want to group by the name of the instance. I want to count it. And I'm just going to see the top 1,000 if I had, that's how many I have. Then I can run this query against my log, and I can see very clearly that this arrow is being distributed across these two instances, right? And again, what do you do if you find that issue on just one instance? You kill it. No, you don't, right? Because this is what a lot of people will do. If you want to get rid of that issue, you would just go ahead and delete it. In Kubernetes, if you delete the, the instance, it will automatically restart it for you. Right? However, what if the application has the same issue two weeks later again? What do you do? You kill it again. Right? Is that what you do with your Java heap? Like, if you're constantly running out of memory every week, you just put this on cron tab, and that's exactly what I'm going to do here with Kubernetes. No, I'm just kidding, no. <laughs> <laughs> we do support cron tab in Kubernetes, but you should not use those cron jobs to kill your instances. <laughs> Just want to make sure. What I have done here is that in my descriptor, I just want to make sure this is still not working, right? It's not like nothing on magical. Okay, still not working. So in my application deployment here, in my load balancer, I mentioned about selecting with the labels. Labels are really, really important in Kubernetes. Even though I'm selecting the label here to say I only want to route traffic for this load balancer to the Hello World UI, I'm also only going to route it if the label of serving is set to true. The labels are arbitrary. You can set whatever labels and values you want. I chose to add an additional label called serving. What that means is that if I go ahead and see my current deployment, and if I see my serving label, uh, all of them would have uh, the serving label set to true, right? So all of my Hello World UI 
will have the serving label to true. If I don't want to kill this instance because I want to I wanna isolate it, I want to you know, ask questions, I want to investigate it, I want to debug it in particular, uh, maybe adding a debugger to it, well, I don't want it to be serving when I add a debugger because then other people will be halted until my debugging session is done. So what I can actually do is to actually change this label and set it to false. Right? So if I go back to my query here and I can see that, that this instance may have an issue, uh, seven, nine, that, that one. So what I can do is I can actually change the label on the fly. And all I need to do is to say kubectl label, uh, overwrite the label for this particular instance. And I'm going to set the label to false. Right? So by doing that, as soon as I do, it, do, do that, if I go back to serving uh, list here, I can see that the label has been changed. And what that means is my load balancer will no longer route traffic to this particular instance. This is super useful. However, if you also look and count the number of UI instances here, they add up to 11. Why? Because in Kubernetes, I said I need to have at least 10 instances with the serving equal to true. I set one to false. Kubernetes, so now you only have nine, and it's going to restart another instance to take over for this instance you took out of service. And you can very clearly see that this is a new instance because it was only started about four seconds ago, right? Now, Right now, I can actually do interesting thing. For example, if I know that this instance may be having issues, uh, a lot of the times this is what I do. I will probably want to go and go exec into it, right? So I can rather than SSH into the machines, do a Docker exec and all that. In Kubernetes, I can just say exec into the right instance, and I can just see everything here. And then um, if I want to, you know, run any of the utilities, like I think kill dash three is uh, doing the thread dump, right? I can do that if I want to. You can run any of the other utilities to, to check it. If you want to attach a debugger, or if you want to test this particular instance just by itself, because if you go through the load balancer, right? Oh, still not working. So it's not limited to this instance, right? But if you go through the load balancer, you don't know which instance this will be routing the traffic to. Uh, what we can do is we can actually do a pull forward. This is really, really useful. I can pull forward into a particular instance, the instance that's having the issue, I can bind my local port on this local host, like 9090, and forward it to the port on the container on port 8080. If I do this, oh, kubectl, there we go, there we go. If I do this, this will actually create a local port 9090, establish a secure tunnel into my instance on port 8080, and if I go and take a look at this application, if I go to localhost, 9090, I should be able to connect to this particular instance. And, oh, interesting. That instance is actually working. Huh. Right? So we can very well establish the fact that this issue is not being caused by this particular instance. Uh, we still have a wider issue with the rest of the application. But we still don't know really, we still don't exactly know why. Okay? But this is really, really useful. You can also, if you want to, attach or forward to a debugger port. You can then attach a debugger to troubleshoot your issues, right? Without having to um, uh, uh, impact your production traffic. When you're done with it, when you're done with troubleshooting this instance, and in this particular case, we established the fact this instance was okay, then what we can do is to override the label, and I can potentially set the label back to true. Or you can just kill it at that time. Right Now you can really get rid of it. However, when you put this label back to true, now you have 11 instances. Uh, Kubernetes will have to get rid of another one, right? Now, unfortunately, um, the, the analogy here, which I hate to use, is that it will, there's some heuristic in terms of how Kubernetes uh, decide on which part to, to kill in this case. Uh, typically, it chooses the one that's unhealthy, and then the one that has lived uh, the, the least time. So the youngest one in that case, right? But it, it tries to keep the longest running application that's the most healthy around. And then, um, you know, in this case, it will delete the ones that's not healthy or that has the least serving time. All right? Very cool. But we still have not solved this issue, right? I, I only have 15 minutes to do it, but we're running down to the wire here. I only have 20 minutes left. Uh, what do you do next? We know the application should be working in staging. Why is it not working in production? I don't know. We troubleshoot the log. We try to isolate the instance. It's not limited to just one instance. This is a broader issue. What do you do next, usually? 
Anyone? Anyone troubleshoot a lot here? I go up. I, I get caught up in 2 a.m. a lot. <laughs> it's not again. It's not because of me. Just saying. <laughs> no, it's then we want to go see the log message again. We want to see if we have enough information in the log, right? So for that particular thing, well, I can go here. I can see the log. But but before we get into that, it is it is a microservices application, right? What that means is when I call the UI, it might be calling other services. I actually don't know where this arrow is coming from in particular, right? For example, if I see this UI, I if I go back to my, um, my, my front end, I know my front end is actually talking to the guestbook service. I know my front end should be talking to Redis and all that. We can see the nice arrows, right, like these lines. Do you actually trust these lines that I draw on the screen? Yeah, no, yes, maybe. Yes, why would you trust me? No, <laughs> no but, well, it depends on how this line is drawn. If this line is drawn based on the reality the real conditions of my application, absolutely. However, unfortunately, these lines are documentation. Okay? The reason I say these are documentation is because I hard-coded these lines in my deployment. So if I scroll down a little bit, here I actually have a little documentation here that says, if the visualizer sees this app, draw a line to Hello World Service and Guestbook Service. Right. So this is actually documentation. Now, the problem with microservices applications is that these lines can be very complicated. And you cannot actually trust any meaningful documentation to be kept up to date. How many of you have ever had an issue where you went to the documentation, you troubleshoot everything for like one hour or two hours, and then you say, well, that doesn't make any sense. And then another person come over and say, yeah, sorry, that documentation hasn't been updated for like a year now. right? That happens a lot, and it could have happened to me because this deployment, these, these lines are fake. Well, like the rest of it is not just the lines you're saying, right? But but then what do we do? This is where you really need a way to observe your clusters. Now there are many many ways to do that. You need monitoring tools like Prometheus and uh, and potentially some other things like uh, a proxy that can help you intercept all the requests and generate all the graph for you, right? Short of that, what you should have at the minimal is distributed tracing. Uh, and this distributed tracing is a, it's not a new concept. I don't know why it's so popular right now based on microservices, but distributed tracing is very, very useful even back in the, so, the SOA days, the service-oriented architecture days. Seven, eight years ago, when I was in a very large SOA deployment, the first thing that my manager told me to do was to make sure that every request has a request ID. And that request ID is propagated between calls to the services. And I said, well, why do we need to do that? Well, he, his response at the time was, well, if, you, if, if there are like 10 service calls, if one of them has issues, we need to know which service actually has the issue. If you have the request ID, you can correlate the logs, you can correlate the request so you can see where it broke in the chain of the calls. And I said, well, again, like, why, why do I need to want to know that? Right? And he said, well, because we're a consulting company. And when the customer asks, whose fault it is, we need to be able to say that very clearly, right? But that's not the, that's not the point of the request ID. What we do need want to know is where in the chain is actually causing the issue so we can actually troubleshoot the problems very, very quickly. So in this case, I have this set up. And in, in the open source world, you will probably do this with Brave and Zipkin. You probably run a Zipkin uh, server somewhere. You can actually you know, capture all the requests. Then you can actually see the nice graph of the call. Uh, that's the, the entire code stack. You can definitely do that. Uh, what we have found down here is you know, we do have a, a hosted service uh, called Stature of a Trace as well. So if I go in there, uh, one second. Still not working, right? No. So it's very, very similar, right? You just send the trace. It works with Zipkin as well. You can store the data in Zipkin, or you can store the data here. But the, at the end of the day, what we need to see is the code stack, something like that, right? I need to be able to see here very clearly when a successful message went through, I went to the UI uh, application, and that made the call to the back end, and that came back in certain time frame. And I can see this very, very clearly. So. I should be able to ask the questions of, well, what happened when I had the 500 error? Right? So I can go and check the status code. I can see a lot of 500 errors here. I can click into it. Right? In this particular case, I can also trace my code stack, and this will be real time. This will be real. This is no longer documentation. This is the reality. So reality says that my UI is in fact calling the hello service. Right? I can see 
uh, all the annotations here, all the metadata here. But if I click into it even more, I can actually see that, oh, there it is. That is the true cause of my 404 error, right? Tracing usually comes as a second thought or afterthought, after you deport everything. I know tons of um, corporates who's trying to go into microservices and they don't actually think about distributed tracing upfront. Without it, it will be very difficult for you to even pinpoint any issue. In this particular case, I was able to just find this very quickly and say, okay, we definitely have an issue in the Hello World service. But how do I validate it, right? You want to make sure you can validate this theory. Well, you can, in this case, try to make a URL, uh, make a curl call. You can make a get call because we see what's actually being sent, right? This is just doing a slash hello. We, you can actually try it out and see if you actually get a 404. But we need to know where, why is this happening? Why am I sending a hello request with n nothing in the payload, right? What do you do in this case? Then you probably want to go back to the logs. And when you do go back to the logs, uh, maybe you just want to have more logs, right? In the past, when you want to do this, when you don't have enough logs in, um, in your system, and you are trying to troubleshoot at 2 a.m. in the morning, uh, what do you do? What do we always do? We got to check out the right revision of the code that's currently in production, right? And then we need to go back there, and we need to add the log message to that code base. And then, hopefully, you have a good CI-CD pipeline that will deploy this within the next two minutes. Most cases, you might not have that CI-CD pipeline. Then you have to wait. I had to wait two hours for a deployment to take place, right? Because, because it, was, it was just a bad system. But, but imagine if you're trying to troubleshoot this 2 a.m. in the morning, and if you add a log message, you wait two hours to see the result. Well, what if it's not happening anymore? And you just wasted your time. What if you found the error message that you just added uh, ask you to add more logs? Well, you got to go through the whole trouble again. In my production system I used to, to, to help with, uh, it was a hotel website. And for hotel websites, their traffic comes in at 8 a.m. Uh, U.S. time sharp. There is no more production after 8, 8 o'clock in the morning. Because if you ever try to do that, nothing will come back up. Everything will just crash. So we actually have to finish everything, all the debugging, all the troubleshooting, all the fixes before 8. If I don't do that, then that whole day is kind of wasted. We have to do a lot more work to get the system back online, right? So we can do better, right? We can definitely do better. In our case, if we find that the log is not sufficient, right? Because I can actually go back to log, right? I can go back to my cluster. I can go to my Hello World UI here, and I can clearly see that I wish I had more log. We can do something even better uh, if you run this anywhere, actually. Uh, if you just attach a little debugger agent from us, uh, we can actually do production debugging and adding log messages on the fly for your applications without interrupting your app, without having to redeploy your app. And to do that, for example, this is really, really useful. This is by far one of my favorite things um, that people should look at, uh, is that if I go here, if I go look at Hello World UI, there we go. Uh, hopefully, it's going to be able to pull down my source. Yeah, so it did pull, pull down my source. You can actually see it here. I can navigate into my UI application, and I can navigate into my uh, UI controller, okay? Uh, and then I can see the code uh, that is associated with uh, my application. Now, let me just delete some of these things right now. What this actually does is it actually checks out the right revision of the application that's currently running in my production Kubernetes cluster. If I want to debug this application right now, this is what I would do. Rather than going through that, you know, check out, write code, deploy cycle, if I want to add a log, I'm going to be a, 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 a true Java developer. This is how we debug applications. We're going to say something like, uh, I want to add a log here. Oh, not that one, sorry. I want to I wanna, like, add, add a log here. And as a true Java developer, this is what I'm going to say. I'm going to say, I'm here. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Yeah, but this is how we debug, right? And then we're going to say another one, I'm here now. Oh, and the name is name. I can add that in here as well. And then finally, if everything goes right, I'm going to be like number three. Uh, I am working, right? As soon as I do this, these log statements are propagated to all of the running instances that's associated with this particular version of my application. And if I go back to my app, do a refresh, the log will actually be produced. 
And if I want to see the log, we know how we do that. We can go to my centralized logger because I don't actually know where the log uh, is, right? So if I go to my logging here, uh, and just again, I'm, let me narrow down to, oh, sorry, the wrong one. Let me try Stern. Maybe Stern works. Stern. Yeah. So, so I can see that error message being produced. If I scroll up a little bit, hopefully, oh, that's a lot. Yeah, that's, uh, that's a very long one. Oh, uh, yeah. I think I should still go back to the, the logger, don't I? Yeah, there we go. Well, that's too bad. It, it should have been there. So let's go find out if it's there. So I'm going to go to my, it, it just like Stern is, is really good for you to see it. But if you have so many messages, it's not just, it's not as useful, right? But we can see very clearly here, there's the exception. But if I s expand some of the messages up here, I can see that the log is actually propagated. I'm actually there, right? And then I can see very clearly that I'm here now and the name is empty, right? And then I don't actually see the third message, which is this is working. So we kind of know where this is breaking. And the fact that the name is empty tells me this is a user error because the user did not put a name in there, right? And that could be the root cause of everything, right? But how do we actually know this for sure? Well, in addition to logging, uh, what this can also do is to take a snapshot. What this is uh, going to be able to do is to almost like a, a real debugger that you run in your uh, IntelliJ, uh, except that rather than stopping the world, we can capture the entire code stack. We can actually see the variables uh, that's actually passing through this line of code at that very moment in time. And we can do the snapshot in either the IDEs or in this console. So for example, if I go here, I have the same application running in my IDE. Uh, what I can do is potentially, let me see here, uh, where's my UI controller, right? I can see that. Let me zoom in a little bit. So again, I'm just doing, I'm using the same thing, except that I'm doing this in ID. I can put this in a debugging mode that is connected to our debugger uh, service here. And what we can actually do is to just add a, a snapshot point here. Uh, let me just put it, uh, where is it? That one? Yeah, why do I put it here and here? I don't know exactly where this is going to happen, but I'm just gonna put it everywhere, right? And now I have these snapshot points. Uh, hopefully, if I go back to my app, and I can also add the snapshot points here too, right? I can add it here. If I go back and refresh my page, uh, it's going to capture this stack, and I can also very clearly see uh, the variables that's being captured for this particular uh, snapshot history. Oh, there it is, right? Um, and I can actually troubleshoot all my issue uh, very, very easily. So let me do that again. Troubleshoot, yeah. Snapshot, take a snapshot. And then I can see that the name is, in fact, empty. And I can see where and how this method got triggered. Uh, this also happened uh, here in IntelliJ2. Um, like these snapshots are also happening directly in the IDE as well. So we can most definitely say that for this particular issue to happen, the user forgot to put the name, right? And the reason why this is happening, to be honest, is because uh, I generated this arrow by doing this, right? So I can actually go into my application and I can say, Ray, hello, DevOps, and say, greet, right? Everything will work. But as soon as I delete the name, uh, this will actually fail. That is the root cause of this issue. Now, the reason why this is continuously happening behind the scenes is really because uh, the, the name is actually put in the session. So the session has the empty name in there the whole time. And until I restart my browser or clear the session, this issue will continue to be happening. Okay, but without a lot of the observability or visibility inside of the application, some of these troubleshooting steps will be very hard to do. You would actually not know what happened in your app uh, unless if you have a way to trace where the code actually failed, a way to validate it, and hopefully a very, very easy way to uh, add additional uh, debugging constructs into your system, All right? Any questions so far? Any questions? No, we're doing all right? Okay, very cool. Now, a few other things I just wanna show uh, that's really, really useful um, in this particular context is that when you do have your centralized logger, no matter which one that is, right, when you do have collected all the log messages, uh, what would be really, really useful is to automatically generate reports on your errors. Because when is the last time you went to production log and say, I wonder what errors I have today? Who's ever done that? I, I never do that, right? We, I only look at the production logs when somebody tells me something's not working. 
but there could be some other errors uh, that's lurking around that you just, you just don't know about, right? So when you do have a centralized logger, uh, in this case, right, they can potentially generate or scan the logs and actually produce um, a report on what new error messages are happening. In this particular case, we can actually see that there were new error messages that I wasn't aware of before, right? And we can see the frequency of that, potentially. And we should be able to see inside and say, okay, how, long, how often does this happen? What is the cause of that? What is the log that's associated with this particular error? And if I really want to, I should be able to see the logs. In other cases, again, if the logs is very, very important in this case. In another case, if you do have a centralized, um, uh, yeah, so like this application has a lot more errors I'm, I'm not aware of, right? But in other cases, if you're using a distributed tracer, what is the most important thing there is that in addition to the ability to see the traces, to understand the real time, um, the real time calls that's taking place, right? To see who's actually calling what. The real value for the tracer is that if you actually produce the logs, with the right trace ID, right? The trace, these UIs should be able to correlate the log directly into that particular request. So in this case, I have done exactly that. All I need to do is to click on show logs. I can see all the logs associated to, associated to every one of these spans. And if there's an error, if there's an error log, uh, I can actually see that here as well. It will just show up as a little error log. And the idea here is that in a single console for your debugging purposes, you should be able to click into it and just do more troubleshooting. You can narrow this down to the other logs associated with the trace, and you can see everything from end to end. That will really help you to troubleshoot your application. I do this a lot myself, uh, given that uh, we do have access to some of these capabilities, all right? So with all that being said, let me just go back to the, um, the slide a little bit, okay, just to recap. Uh, tracing. If you, uh, you should definitely have some kind of distributed tracing. Uh, the open source alternative for that is, would be Zipkin, which is really, really nice. If you do want to store it on uh, Google Cloud, for example, uh, we do have a proxy that takes existing Zipkin uh, traces. We can import that directly into our system as well, so you don't have to uh, store that uh, funding storage for your traces. Uh, you, we can actually also generate automatic reports for that, so we naturally know how long everything took place. So we can actually give you a report to tell you your services is running slower today than last week, right? That's really, really nice thing to know. Um, and then finally, if you do want to try some of these production debugging capabilities, we use the same debugger in production at Google, right? And this is battle tested that we know it's not going to cause you even more issue in production. Um, and you can do this in your own environment. Uh, even without being on the cloud. Just keep that in mind. You can run this debugging agent directly on your Kubernetes clusters for your applications on-prem if you like, okay? And finally, um, one thing I don't get a chance to talk about is the monitoring the entire Kubernetes system. Uh, for that, that's more DevOpsy, but uh, just in case you want to know about that, please come and find me afterwards. So with all that said, all the information, all the source code, all the slide, uh, all the, um, the demos and examples, uh, they are all on my website on satanism.me slash talks. You can find this particular talk. And I would also very, very um, appreciate if, the, if you go there and then send me your feedback on your thoughts on this particular session. There's a little feedback link on the top. And um, again, uh, thank you so much for your time. And um, that's all from me. Thank you so much.